Okay, so we're recording. Um, here's where we were last time. We were talking about um, average value of a function. And remember, the big idea of average value of a function is this is a weighted average. It's copying the idea of a weighted average uh, where we use uh, size in the domain as the weights, right? So dx uh, for a single variable function uh, it represents size in the domain. Um, and uh, then we're looking at the average value of the function. And then, uh, of course, we add up over the entire interval, uh, namely we integrate over, uh, over the entire interval. So this is our formula. And uh, last time, uh, we ended by just pointing out that, well, yeah, you can just plug and chug straight from this formula. So um, the same idea can apply if you have a function of more than one input variable. If you have more than one input variable, then, well, you're just going to have, for example, for two input variables, double integrals, and size in the domain is now areas instead of, uh, instead of lengths or you know, widths or however you want to call it. Okay, so for example, if you want to compute the average value of the function x squared over the unit disk, uh, <clears throat> how do we make sense out of that? Well, it, uh, we go straight from the above formula. Um, the area of the unit disk, of course, is pi, right? That's just a pat geometry formula. That's convenient. Uh, and then uh, the function that we're averaging is our integrand. And then uh, we have a double integral to compute. And how do you compute this double integral? We have various options. Um, I think the uh, most straightforward way to do it is polar coordinates and, again, plug and chug. Okay. All right, so why all this business about averages and weighted averages and uh, you know, average value of a function um, in a section that's about applications? And uh, this is actually a really nice buildup. Uh, it builds up to a wonderful way to think about center of mass, and this is very much a physics idea. So um, it rolls off the tongue very nicely to say center of mass is the weighted average of position. Very simple. Um, very natural way to think about center of mass. Why would we be interested in center of mass anyway? Well, it's an average of the positions of the various pieces of mass that we're talking about. Right? So pretty natural. Uh, so uh, anyway, here's the uh, uh, you know sort of uh, generic formula for uh, for a weighted average. Um, we are uh, taking a weighted average of position. Right, the locations of the pieces of mass, and hopefully, pretty natural choice, we're going to use the masses themselves as the weights. Okay, so I think again, pretty uh, pretty easy to motivate. Uh, you know why we'd be uh, interested in such a thing. So uh, there you go. Uh, now. <clears throat> Um, here's a different way to think about center of mass. Uh, if you're not persuaded by this idea of, you know, wanting to do a natural sort of an average of position, uh, another nice fact about this formula, this thing called x bar, is it's the balance point. So in other words, that's where you would put your finger to support if you had, you know, a certain amount of mass at that position and a certain amount of mass at that position, and if you wanted to know where do I put my finger to, to keep it balanced, in other words, if I want the torque from the left piece of mass pulling counterclockwise and the torque from the right piece of mass pulling clockwise, I want those to oppose each other exactly so that it balances. It would be exactly uh, at that point. And exactly how to see that is a little bit of an algebra exercise. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, you can uh, just kind of write down the total torque equals zero, work out the algebra, move things around a little bit, and uh, it turns out to be this. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, how do we generalize to instead of you know two pieces of mass? What if we have a continuum of uh, you know mass distributed over some region? And same idea, we generalize with the same general construction. Weighted average of position using the masses as the weights. Right? Just now integrating instead of adding. Okay, um, now this does bring up a weird little question. 
Weird. Uh, we haven't actually seen an integral like this before, right? What do we mean when we say a uh, double integral where the integrand is a vector, right? Haven't done it before. So uh, here's the good news. Um, it's exactly what you would hope, uh, keeping in mind that if you, uh, if you have a vector in the integrand, right, then that means you have a bunch of coordinates in that vector. And the integral is just done one coordinate at a time. So that integral right there breaks down into, well, that integral, et cetera, through that integral. So again, exactly what you would hope. Okay, so let's do an example of this. And this is uh, getting into some multivariable calculus. Uh, let's compute the uh, center of mass of this shape right here. This is the uh, upper half disk. And now I'm, uh, you'll notice in this example, I'm uh, assuming that the mass is distributed uniformly, uh, constant density of one. That's just to make the algebra work out more reasonably. Uh, in a real world setting, it may or may not be that. And of course, that just factors right into the integral. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, in this particular case then, wanting to find that center of mass, we start off with this formula for the x-coordinate, right? Straight out of what we just wrote down. First coordinate of the center of mass. Density being one, mass is equal to area. Okay. All right, now how do we compute that integral? And you have a few choices, I suppose. Uh, uh, this, uh, this integral uh, right here, you could brute force it, I guess. Um, seems like it would be unnecessary work because, in fact, zero by symmetry. And this kind of thing comes up a lot in, well, I can speak firsthand that it comes up a lot in physics, right? And I'm morally certain that it also comes up a lot in engineering, and I know a lot of y'all are engineering majors. So um, be on the lookout. Notice, by the way, this did not announce itself, right? This was an integral that we wrote down. We, we just, uh, we're just uh, writing down the formulas, and we had to notice that this was an opportunity for symmetry, right? So uh, that is uh, nature of the beast, and uh, please do be on the lookout. You, it's kind of, in some sense, if you want to make effective use of symmetry arguments, you have to constantly be on the lookout for those opportunities. Uh, please do uh, think through the details. Remember, uh, therein lies the devil, right? Uh, a lot of critical, critical details to think through. Um, okay, uh, <clears throat> second coordinate. The y-coordinate, there you go. Again, copying from the integral on the previous page. Um, now, let me show you the, the risk, the danger on this integral. This one also kind of looks like it would be susceptible to a symmetry argument. Let me, let me, tr let me try to make the, the, uh, the siren song uh, that is uh, completely inappropriate here. Our domain is symmetric. It is. It really is. No kidding. Our integrand here has an odd power and therefore has an odd symmetry. And so you can see the elements are there. It's, oh, it really looks like they're going to fit together. But in fact, they don't. Uh, y only has odd symmetry if you are reflecting like so, namely if you are reflecting through the x-axis. So y's line of odd symmetry is the x-axis, whereas, on the other hand, the line of symmetry of the domain is the y-axis. So different lines of symmetry, no symmetry theorem applies. Everybody see that? OK, so please, please, please be real careful. It's so easy to look at this, and you see daylight at the end of the tunnel, and you run for it. Right, and you've got to then you step on the landmine, and uh, it's uh, it's tragic. Okay, always think through your symmetry arguments uh, carefully. Okay, so to compute this integral, tragically, we have to uh, we have to decide, you know, which of these uh, iterated integrals we want to choose. And I, I guess I suppose you could do this with polar coordinates uh, as well. Um, you know, so take your pick. 
Um, uh, but between these two options, I do want to point out one thing, and this is again kind of tangential, right? But uh, we've talked about how to decide between dx dy versus dy dx. And I've given you a couple of, you know, kind of um, you know, uh, considerations on that. One is try not to slice through corners. Neither one slices through corners, right? Uh, try to avoid uh, forcing yourself into a corner where you have to uh, you have to uh, solve for a variable in terms of the other, and you end up with something ugly like square roots. Well, th that's unavoidable here. We're going to end up with square roots either way. So, according to the criteria I've given you in the past, these are indistinguishable in terms of which one do we like better. But I'll tell you which one I like better. I like this second option. And the reason why is when I do this very first anti-differentiation, right, the very first little step there, I'm going to get y squared. I will therefore be squaring this square root. The square root disappears and the outside integral is easy. So that's nice. Right. Whereas, by contrast, uh, nowhere near as desirable, uh, up here, uh, there is no y squared in that first antiderivative that you compute. Right? Uh, you just get x, y, and then you uh, effectively are going to end up with y times that square root. And how do you integrate that? Well, you have to do a substitution. Not that that's bad. right? It's perfectly doable in this case, but still, I think you've got to give the nod. I think this one's a little better. So just another thing to be on the lookout for. Um, you never know when something like this is going to pop up. And uh, certainly in a scenario when the integrals aren't as doable as these are, and I'm sorry to report, there are some pretty nasty integrals out there. Again, personal experience, right? Um, very valuable to be, again, sort of thinking critically about which one of these options you want to choose. So this is another thing to be on the lookout for. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, this next thing is a highly physics-oriented topic. Uh, this is not a physics course. The only reason I include physics in Math 219 is because, well, it does make some pretty great examples of how to use Math 219 ideas, right? So uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the ideas uh, here is uh, is going to come up and be very handy. And that is the idea of a Riemann sum. Uh, and so I think this makes this actually a really nice example uh, of Math 219 ideas. Um, there is a lot to say from a physics point of view about moment of inertia, what we're going to be doing here. I'm going to say a little bit about that, but I'm going to try to keep myself in check on that because, again, this is not a physics class. Okay, so here's uh, the first thing I want to start with. If you have an axis and if you have some uh, object that is rotating around that, then you have a circle. And circles have this nice feature um, that arc length and central angle are closely related by the radius. So this is just an old uh, high school geometry fact I'm sure you'll all recall. And then we take a derivative with respect to time. And you get this related nice relationship here, which relates what you might call linear speed, namely the rate of change of a linear um, uh, 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 coordinate of position, uh, and this thing that we call angular speed. This omega here, this is the time rate of change of an angular position coordinate. Okay? So linear on the left, angular on the right. And again, related by the radius. Okay, so that's going to be uh, uh, something that's going to come up in just a second. We're going to now think about the uh, question I have written here, which is how do you compute uh, the kinetic energy of something that's rotating, um, you know, like so. And well, this formula here works great if you're talking about a particle. Right? If you're talking about a point mass, because that point mass, you can just you know use these formulas right here, and if you know uh, how how long it takes to make a complete rotation, you can kind of reverse engineer what the angular speed is and therefore what the velocity is. Blah blah blah, right? And uh, easy calculation one half mv squared. Okay, here's where things get weird. 
What if you are interested in computing the kinetic energy of a large lump like so? And that thing is rotating around this axis. How do I compute the kinetic energy? And here's the nasty problem. Uh, <clears throat> the nasty fact is that uh, a little piece of mass right there is only traveling a very short distance in the amount of time it takes to go you know, uh, once around. Whereas this little piece of mass over here, quite a bit farther away, and it is traveling a much greater distance in the same amount of time. So uh, to put it more bluntly, this piece of mass has a lower speed than that piece of mass. The speed that these pieces of mass are traveling are not the same. Right? And so uh, what do I do down here for velocity? I don't have a velocity that I can plug in. Velocity is not constant. So we're, we're um, kind of dead in the water on this formula right there. Everybody see the problem? Unfortunate problem? Yeah. All right, so this is a really nice example of a uh, of an uh, accumulating quantity argument. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to argue that if you just take your solid, chop it up into little pieces, look at one little piece at a time, then you can add those up. So in particular, surely kinetic energy is an accumulating quantity. If I, if I have a lump that's moving, I can chop it up into little pieces, compute the kinetic energy of each. The whole is the sum of the parts. And then on each piece, on each individual piece, I can just write down 1 half mv squared. Because on each individual little teeny tiny little piece, all of the mass inside of each little teeny tiny piece is moving with pretty much the same velocity. Right? And so 1 half mv squared totally works. So um, this is, uh, you know, from a math point of view, I think the most interesting part of this uh, is that we use a, an accumulation argument, a chop it up, add it up argument, to compute kinetic energy. And that's the first example that we've seen of uh, something like that. Now, where it gets physics-y is uh, the next few steps here. Uh, now, you can uh, take this expression we have and sort of move things around. Uh, good exercise to think through all that stuff. Um, our formula for kinetic energy ends up being this. Uh, okay, which I guess is fine, but check this out. If you just make this choice to take that thing there and give that a name, call it moment of inertia, or, you know, it doesn't even really matter, of course, but th we call this moment of inertia. Now, our kinetic energy formula actually looks a lot like our previous kinetic energy formula. You might call this the linear kinetic energy formula up here because we're talking about linear speed, whereas you might call this an angular kinetic energy formula because it relates to angular speed, right? And so this gives rise to a, a, a nice little point of view in the same sense that linear speed and angular speed are kind of analogous to each other, one linear, one angular. Likewise, This thing that we decided to just give a name to, uh, we called it I, we call it moment of inertia. That thing, in the same sense that this is an angular analog of speed, moment of inertia is an angular analog of mass. And that's a very handy point of view. If you have stuff that's rotating, right, which, by the way, wheels on your car, rotating, lots of energy in those wheels. Right? Um, you got to decide for yourself, wait, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? We want to conserve energy, right? Do we really want to spend a bunch of energy on the wheels? Right? I mean, this is not, it's a, some pretty serious questions in there about how you make your car the most efficient. And knowing how much energy is just in the fact that your wheels are spinning, it's a big deal, right? So, very engineering relevant and uh, 
moment of inertia is a critical tool to being able to uh, play around with questions like that. Yeah. Why are you able to pull out like the anchor to speed? Is it is it a constant? Do what now? Like why are you able to pull out W squared? Oh yeah 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 because yeah literally because it's constant. So now you remember up here, and I was talking about when you have a great big lump like this, they're not all moving with the same linear velocity, but every chunk makes exactly one full rotation. Every chunk moves an angular distance, you might say, of two pi during one rotation. So yes, every object in there has the same angular speed. So it is indeed constant. Yeah. Right. All right. Okay, so this is why physicists and therefore engineers uh, are interested in this thing called moment of inertia, right? Typically, uh, typically written with an I. Uh, and the key formula for y'all to remember is what I have written down here. It's an integral of R squared dm. dm is density times dv. R, don't forget, is the, di oh, uh, let's see, let me put this up here. R is the distance from uh, whatever piece of mass you're looking at to your axis of rotation. And um, if you're talking about a three-dimensional solid like we were here, then it's a triple integral. If you're talking about a two-dimensional thing that's rotating, double integral. Right? Exactly what you would expect. Okay, so uh, do be careful about this R business. Uh, it is uh, tempting to make the syntactical confusion that, oh, hey, ah, that reminds me of cylindrical coordinates, right? We use R for uh, the distance from the z-axis, right? And sometimes that's actually the case. Uh, sometimes you are rotating around the z-axis, in which case your R, yes, indeed, is your usual cylindrical R, but you don't have to be, right? And let's again go back to cars, right? And wheels, they're not rotating around the Z axis, right? They're rotating around a different axis. Uh, so you have to tailor your formula for R appropriately. Here, you'll notice, for example, I have a line that's sort of parallel to the X axis. What if we're rotating about that line? instead of the z-axis. Well, then any given little piece of mass I might be looking at, that r is a very different expression. Right? So you always have to think it through. You cannot memorize your way of you know, a finite number of cases <laughs> right? and, uh, and, and just memorize all these different formulas for r. Uh, there's various different answers that you get depending on the particulars of the question. Uh, if your piece, uh, if your if your mass is over area, like I have here in the xy plane, then r is well, it's just the distance to the y-axis, namely absolute value of x. So again, always draw the picture, always think it through. Don't try to memorize cases. Uh, here is uh, the example I'll walk you through. Uh, we want to compute moment of inertia, and so we write down our formula, integral r squared dm. Uh, we're talking about a two-dimensional piece of area here, and so that's why this is a double integral, not a triple integral. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Now we've got to think through what R is. Um, R, in this case, we're talking about little pieces of mass. Uh, we're talking about rotating around the x-axis. So the x-axis is our axis. And now we have to ask, what is that distance? Right, the distance from a point x comma y down to the x-axis. And of course, that distance is literally, in this case, exactly the y-coordinate of that point, and so that's why our R here is just Y. Is that good? Um, everything else is uh, pretty plug and chug. Um, I'm going to uh, leave it as an exercise for y'all to make sure that you can do integrals like this. You'll notice I have the, the dot, dot, dot there. Uh, please do make sure that you can work stuff like this out. Um, integrals, you know, it's just no way to get around the fact that single variable integrals are really important in multivariable calculus. Um, so stuff like this, I think these are very reasonable integrals. 
Um, I'm going to call this two integrals because there's two terms. Right? And to be fair, each of these is, I mean, there's that one little trick that makes it work, right? But they're pretty standard little tricks, and I want to make sure that y'all are uh, good to go. So, so do make sure that you are comfortable uh, with not only working out these integrals, but working out integrals you know, of this general category and uh, comparable type integrals as well. Okay. Okay. So that finishes Chapter 5. And we are moving along now to Chapter 6. Uh, oh, let me, uh, let me pause uh, real quick. So uh, I'm sure you all, all remember we have a test on Friday. Right? Uh, good luck with all your studying and preparing. Um, recall that uh, today's material is not fair game for the exam. Right? Uh, it's uh, just an oddity of the schedule, but I don't think it would be fair to present material on a Wednesday and test you on a Friday. Right? That's, uh, that's too quick of a turnaround um, when, we can, uh, when we can just as well avoid it. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so f Monday was our last day of new material, uh, and I've already forgotten the numbers, but I think the fair game material ended with section 5.5, if I remember correctly, yeah. So all this 5.6 stuff we just did, none of it is fair game for midterm. Nor is the chapter 6 stuff we're going to do now. Okay, so on to um, a new kind of integrals. We're going to talk now about something called a scalar line integral. Uh, we will later get to vector line integrals later as in next week. But uh, let's uh, uh, talk about scalar line integrals. Uh, the big point I'm going to start with is to notice a pattern. Every integral we've seen so far the domain has been the same dimension as the world it lives in. Let me talk through what I mean by that. Single variable integrals. An interval is the, is the domain. And an interval is one dimensional and it lives in the x-axis, also one dimensional. Okay, double integrals. Double integrals are two-dimensional domains that live in a two-dimensional plane. Again, two and two, perfect match. Triple integrals over three-dimensional solids that live in a three-dimensional space. Again, that matches, right? That's, that's uh, just kind of the only thing we've entertained so far. So now we're going to entertain a harder question, and that is, what if your domain is dimensionally awkward? Right? So for example, uh, here is a curve that is an intrinsically one-dimensional thing, right? This doesn't have any area. This is one It has a length. It has no area. This is intrinsically one-dimensional. Uh, but it doesn't live on an axis. It lives in a plane, which is two-dimensional. So dimensionally awkward. Uh, if I wanted to do an integral on this domain, uh, uh, it's not a double integral. There's no area. But it's also not a single variable integral exactly, right? Because the domain's curving. And Calc 1 doesn't address that at all. OK, so uh, yeah, awkward. Why are we doing this at all? Why do we need to talk about an integral over a, for example, a curve? And um, there's various pretty natural answers to this question. There are plenty of examples of quantities that accumulate over curves in space. And so um, one that I think is kind of fun to talk about is uh, uh, years ago, I did a calculation to try to um, document how much effort I had put into shoveling my driveway. And it was a lot. It was a lot of hard work, and I wanted credit for my hard work that I had put in. Right? And so I computed the mass of snow that had been on my driveway. And at the time, I lived on a, in a property where they had a very long curved driveway. Right? So how do you do that? Well, uh, I mean, technically, a driveway is an area. But really, it's more natural to think of a driveway as following a curve. And on any given little piece of curve, if I look at some little short length of that driveway, for that given length, 
I could talk about the width of the driveway and the depth of the snow and multiply by the density of the snow, which you can look up online. Okay? Um, and uh, there you go. So for any given piece of length, there is a corresponding mass of snow. And so I then add up over a curve. Right? So this, again, is a, a, uh, 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 a, a, an example of an accumulating quantity that accumulates over a curve. So in such cases, on each little piece, we're going to view it as being quantity per unit length times length. However your algebra works out on whatever that accumulating quantity is, right? Um, it's going to be some sort of, you know, in, in my case, mass of snow per unit length on the driveway times length of each little piece on the driveway. Um, <clears throat> and uh, with that noted, then, of course, we're just going to add up over the entire driveway. Does that make sense to everybody? I don't remember what the answer was, but it was like 50,000 pounds. Or something. It was ridiculous. It was uh, backbreaking. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't have to lift it up, right? You just shove it to the side, but still, still a lot. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, so what do we uh, do about this? How am I going to compute expressions like this? Um, we'll get to that in a moment, but I am going to first, uh, whoops, first point out uh, that we can uh, make the notation convenient. Y'all are probably not too terribly surprised that as with every other integral, when you have a limit of a summation, we're going to use an integral symbol. It's just notation, right? It's a notational choice, but it's a, uh, a classic. Uh, choice, and then of course delta whatever is going to turn into d whatever. Again, that's just notation. Right? There's no magic meaning uh, of the d. Uh, and uh, so, no surprise. Hopefully, our overall notation for this uh, accumulation expression is going to be this. Is that cool? Um, now let's talk terminology. Um, this is called a line integral. Um, awkwardly, we call it a line integral because the domain is a curve. <laughs> I feel like they should call it a curve integral, right? Uh, but I suppose in some contexts, uh, you know, this could be viewed as a, you know, line writ large. You know, like if you think about art, they talk about line drawings, right? Well, okay, so they mean curves but the, just a different use of the term. So anyway, it's a little unfortunate, but oh well. Um, we call this a scalar line integral because it turns out there's a totally different kind of line integral we're going to see later. Uh, by contrast with that other one we're going to see later, this one has as its integrand and its differential both scalars. So we are soon going to see something called a vector line integral. And as you might expect, a vector line integral, the integrand is going to be a vector. And weirder, the differential is going to be a vector. And that's uh, creepy to imagine why we'd ever care about such a thing, but that's going to arise very naturally. We'll see that um, on, uh, on Monday. OK, so scalar line integral. Is everybody OK? Everybody happy? Okay, so uh, how do we um, how do we compute these things? If I have an integral over a curve, whoops, try to hit that a little better. Integral over a curve, um, we have what I'm going to call here an undesirable domain. I don't like this as a domain. Right? I've never seen how to integrate something like this because of the domain. Now, we've seen domains we haven't liked in the past. Corners, um, you know, weird equations of curves that are the, the edges, you know, various different unpleasant, you know, realities of certain kinds of domains. Um, and we have a strategy for how to deal with undesirable domains. What you do is you view them as being images by way of some function, and then you pull back 
to rewrite your integral over the undesirable domain instead as an integral over your preferred, hopefully, more desirable domain, right? So this is, that's the change of variable strategy. Um, uh, that's not quite exactly what we're doing here, but it's morally what we're doing here. Um, the, uh, the, the, the difference is, is that, again, for the dimensionally awkward reasons, uh, the pullback is not living inside of two dimensions, right? So it's not exactly a change of variables function, but what it does is, what it, what it, what it is, the familiar thing that this is, um, is a uh, parameterization, right? A parameterization is a function that takes in t coordinates and spits out points that trace out your curve. And so literally, when you parameterize a curve, you are making that curve the image. The image of your parameterization. How are we doing? I see that this is kind of morally equivalent. So we're in business. We, we have a lot of experience with doing pullbacks, right? All you really need is to figure out the stretching factor. Namely, we need to know, okay, okay, for some little dt for some little small amount of time we like to think of it as uh, what uh, how much distance do we cover uh, and I just need to know what do you multiply by dt to get ds let me say that differently what do I multiply by elapsed time to get distance traveled well distance is speed times time. And so that gives us this nice little formula down here, this ds that I want to relate to that dt. No sweat. Our stretching factor is just speed, the magnitude of velocity. Is that cool? So we're in business. Uh, let's see here. Let me uh, clean up the mess here. Uh, yeah, so our integral, our scalar line integral, which up until just seconds ago was just an abstract notation to represent a strategy for chopping up some expression and adding up over. I mean, it was this was a this was all sort of abstraction. But now, again, we have this handy formula that ds is speed times dt. You can plug in your parameterization. That tells you position. I missed. Look at that. Oh, gosh. Uh, that tells you position as a function of time. And off you go. Single variable integral, nothing to it, plug and chug, easy to compute. Everybody happy? Okay. Okay, let's do one. Oh, I, I got ahead of myself. Um, sorry. Um, we need to talk about this. Uh, there, there is a very legitimate gripe that one could bring up uh, with this formula, and that is, hey, wait a minute, this thing that I'm trying to compute uh, it seems to depend on which parameterization you pick. Now, there's a bunch of different ways to parameterize a curve, right? Lots of, there's no canonical way to parameterize a curve. So if I pick one parameterization, I'll get one integral. If you pick a different parameterization, you get a totally different integral. Whose integral is right? And a uh, uh, valid concern, and uh, the, the good news is uh, it, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, parameterize any way you want. It's all good. Uh, Whatever is your most convenient parameterization would be my advice, right? And uh, you'll always get the same answer. So nice little bit of good news there. How are we doing? Everybody happy? Yeah? That's because A and B are going to be different. Yeah, A and B will be different correspondingly. Yep, yep. That's right. Okay, so now let's do one. Um, here we go. Uh, oh, uh, but real quick while I'm at it, 
on, uh, on this point here about um, these integrals being independent of parameterization. The book does prove that. And that's more math 222 kind of stuff. That's really not what we're here for. It, it's beautiful mathematics, and I'm glad it's in there. And feel free to look if you're curious, but you're not responsible. Uh, that is uh, more of a math 222 kind of thing and not math 219 appropriate. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's do one. Uh, actually, we're going to do four kind of all at the same time. You can see I have uh, four separate calculations right here. Um, and the reason I'm doing four calculations at the same time is because of how much these calculations have in common with each other. Uh, let's see here. Let me do it about like this. Um, <clears throat> so the scenario we're going to consider is we have a wire that follows a curve that's parameterized like so. So there's our curve, pre-parameterized. And mass is distributed across that curve. Um, uh, depending on location by that formula. So um, that being given, we could reasonably ask how much mass of snow is on that driveway, right? Or how? Uh, what's the center of mass, one might reasonably ask. Or uh, what's, the, uh, what's the moment of inertia of all of that around the x-axis, for example? A bunch of different questions that you could ask, right? Okay. And we're going to do kind of all of them at the same time because all of these questions are talking about the same wire following the same curve, parameterized by the same function, which therefore has the same derivative, which therefore has the same uh, speed and thus the same stretching factor formula right there. All that's the same for all four of these questions, right? All four of these questions, mass, center of mass, moment of inertia, whatever, they all talk about the same curve and thus all of this, all these details here are going to be shared uh, for all of these examples. Um, so uh, let's uh, walk through a couple of them. I'll leave the others as exercises for y'all. Um, uh, we're going to do here uh, the mass and the, uh, let's see, the x-coordinate of the center of mass. Now, these starting points are um, yeah, pretty straightforward. Um, this, uh, this very first thing that I write down here is, you know, I like to, I like to just uh, give a little bit of recognition to the fact that mass is an accumulating quantity. The whole is the sum of the parts. It, I mean, the algebra reads very satisfyingly in, in English, right? Um, and then uh, here, now this is a formula that we've already derived. This isn't directly an accumulation argument, but this is something we already know about how to compute the x-coordinate of the center of mass. Okay. All right. Um, now, in both cases, Mass is density times size. Exactly the same for both of these. Um, in both cases, we're talking about, again, the same wire that has the same density. And so density is uh, x plus y for both of these. Right. In both cases, uh, we're talking about um, Parameterizing and therefore ds is speed times dt in both cases. And in both cases, we therefore have the same formula for the stretching factor, which is this square root right here. So a lot, you can see now, there's a couple of differences, obviously different starting integrals, so of course there's a couple of little differences, but a lot of the calculation here is just a rip off of the calculation here and vice versa. Everybody see that? Is that cool? Okay. Okay, one other thing to keep in mind. Uh, now, how do we, um, uh, how do we uh, get rid of this x right here, for example? How am I going to rewrite x? Uh, I need to rewrite this in terms of t because, of course, I'm trying to pull back. I want to get a dt integral. So what is x anyway? 
don't forget the parameterization is what tells you right so the parameterization is literally telling me that that right there is x and likewise that that right there is y parameterizations literally give you position x and y position as functions of time and so in particular here's how x is a function of time and here's how y is a function of time so it's easy to kind of lose track of that sort of thing but that noted this x is just t and so is that one and so is that one and this y is t squared and so is that one right so again uh, even though these are different integrals different physical quantities we're computing we're using the same parameterization to pull them back. Is that all right? Okay. All right, so good exercises for y'all uh, to think through uh, these last two. Uh, again, highly analogous, same parameterization, same speed, same lot of stuff, um, and just different starting integrals. And so the integrals work out a little differently, but a lot in common. Okay, next. Here's a, um, again, kind of real-world-ish uh, scenario. Uh, suppose you have a fence. Uh, your fence is on your property line, let's say, which is, uh, let's say, a unit circle in this case. And uh, how do we think of a fence? Well, the fence sits on top like this with pickets. Something like that. And, um, you know, you build a fence, probably ought to paint it or stain it or something. It lasts a lot longer, right? So how much stain do you need? When you buy stain at the hardware store or whatever, uh, they sell it uh, by buckets and they tell you how many square feet of coverage. They tell you how much area of coverage it will do. And so you're going to need to know what the area of your fence is. Right, um, and then don't forget to multiply by two. You got to multiply. You got to do both sides. Right, um, but uh, how do we compute the area of uh, just one side of the fence? And I argue that the whole is the sum of the parts. Um, the total area is the sum of these little pieces of area, like so. These little pieces coming from taking our curve and uh, breaking up our whole curve into a bunch of little sort of little pieces of curve, let's say of, of length ds. And uh, so how can I relate the area that I need to know to the ds, um, you know, like little bit of length along the curve? Well, you know, pretty straightforward argument. It's going to be height which is given in the statement of the question, uh, times base, which again is ds. And so this little piece of area for that one picket, you might say, right? h times ds. Everybody OK with that? And yeah, again, then the uh, the total area that we're actually interested in, the grand total area, um, is the uh, what you get when you add up all those picket areas. Okay, that's our big picture uh, strategy. Now I've got to think through the details. How uh, then do I compute this uh, this line integral? And recall that our very first thing for computing a line integral, you do have to parameterize your curve. Right, that's our big strategy for, for pulling back is we view that, that curve domain as being an image and then we pull back through that parameterization. So how do I parameterize the unit circle? Well, that's an easy one. There you go. Reminder, there's lots of parameterizations of the unit circle. Countless. Pick your favorite one. This is my favorite one because it's the easiest to work with. Right? So again, up to you. 
Um, with that parameterized, you can then take the derivative to get the velocity. You take the magnitude to get the speed. That speed is our stretching factor. And now it's just a matter of plugging in. If I can get this to cooperate, here we go. Um, so, yeah, the height was given in the statement of the question. Um, ds, speed times dt, established on the previous page, or established two pages ago. Um, our speed, we just computed. Our speed is 1. Nice and convenient. Uh, what is x? This, again, is uh, where a lot of students kind of get confused. Wait a minute, what is x? Don't forget, your parameterization is literally telling you position. Namely, it's literally telling you your x and y as functions of t. And so in this case, x is cosine t. And now uh, you can see down here at the bottom we have a uh, good old-fashioned single variable integral. And uh, this is an easy one, of course. Plug and chug, compute that integral. Okay, we're out of time. See you all later. Have a good one. Good luck on the exam on Friday. See you then.